The Narcissus Stare The eyes feature prominently in an engagement with another person. You look into someone's eyes to read them, to allow them to read you. You look away from someone in order to convey certain emotions. You fail to meet somebody's gaze to convey others. Ordinarily, staring at another person is considered to be rude and ill-mannered, although it may denote fascination and even infatuation. But even that stare from a besotted admirer can be regarded as rude, intrusive, never mind the unending gaze of a passerby who can't believe what he or she is witnessing. The stare when deployed by our kind, however, takes on a different application together, and it actually manifests at different times during your dynamic with us. Number one, the stare in seduction. This is not used by all of our kind, but if you have been subjected to it, you will know it, and you will remember it well. It was the time when those brilliant blue eyes locked with your own and stared deep inside of you. Those flashing emerald eyes appeared transfixed as they stared at you. The rich brown eyes, which seemed to melt as they gazed at you, wavering. Whatever colour our eyes are, when you first received that seductive stare, the colour seemed to become brighter, the light appeared to shine in them, and the intensity of our gaze was immense. It was not so much as being looked at, but rather an event in itself. Our steady stare was unusual, as you probably had not experienced it from anybody else previously. You wanted to look away, torn between a sense of discomfort, but the mesmerizing quality of our eyes kept you looking back into them. At that moment, our relentless gaze told you that you, and only you, mattered. There was nothing else of consequence in the universe. The background drained away, the surrounding sounds became muted, and all distractions were removed. We wanted to show you that our devotion to you was beyond anything else. Only by allowing us to stare at you for such a long time were we able to convey the depths of our love, the vastness of our desire for you, the sheer scale of our need to be with you. Time slowed, and then stood still. Your skin tingled from the experience of this tantalizing stare. Your breath caught in your lungs, your face seemed to flush, and the wave of addiction washed across you, sending a shiver up and down your spine, around your neck and twisting your stomach. In that instant, we became your universe as we showed you the world in our eyes. Yet, what you really looked on, as those two eyes continued to bore deep into you, was yourself. We commenced this engagement by staring at you for an unconventional length of time, and this would make you both feel uncomfortable and captivated, a strange kind of bittersweetness, so that you would then show us what was in your eyes. You would reveal to us your desire, your love, your hopes, your wants, and your dedication. All we did was mirror back at you what you showed to us amplified through the auspices of the mimicry for which we have become known. In that moment, as we held your gaze from across the table, or after that kiss, or as we lay on top of you, we showed you yourself, and thus sowed the seeds that caused you to fall in love with us. But really, it was with yourself. That is why your love became something beyond that which you had experienced before. That is why it was deep, powerful, and absolute. Because your subconscious saw what it wanted to see, and this fired a powerful and immense response in you. The world whirled in our eyes. Your world 
be offered limitless possibilities through the promises that we mirrored back at you. And by keeping you in this gaze, we told you that we wanted you above anything else. We wanted you. We wanted you. We wanted you. That desire for you which shone in our eyes was actually our desire to control you for your fuel, for your character traits, and for those residual benefits. This was provided unconsciously by the lesser or mid-range and consciously by the greater or ultra. Of course, since you did not know who you were dealing with, you honestly mistook that stare of desire as us wanting you, the person, your characteristics, who you are. That was not the case. This steady magnetic stare is of course not utilised by all narcissists, where deployed by the lesser or mid-range narcissists, they actually do believe they want you for being you. Their narcissism does not allow them to know the genuine reason they want you, nor why they are staring so intently at you. The greater and ultra know precisely what we are doing and why. The stare in seduction demonstrates our sense of entitlement to keep looking at you, the sense of ownership and objectification. We are looking at you like some expensive painting that we own or an enticing motor vehicle that we are about to buy. Our lack of emotional empathy, we have no interest if this stare makes you feel somewhat uncomfortable or embarrassed to receive such attention. It also exhibits our lack of boundary recognition and is a form of manipulation designed to assert benignly control over you directly. 2. The Stare in Devaluation Stranger Zone In Stranger Zone, a separate video you can listen to, I explained about the Stranger Zone setting where the person who once lit up your life becomes a stranger, almost robotic. This is a change which occurs as the devaluation commences. Again, it's not always present as some of our kind move straight into the dark abuses of the devaluation from the outset. But there is a precursor to this, when the person who once walked in with a cheery smile and a kiss just enters and sits down, devoid of any prevailing emotion. If you experience this, then you may also experiencing the stare at this juncture. This will be a hollow, empty gaze, which is accentuated by the blank expression that accompanies it. It is not a look of confusion or misapprehension. It is not a look of dim-wittedness, but is instead the empty stare of an empty person. You are looking at the void that exists within all of our kind. This represents the crossroads. The seductive stare glowed, fizzed and shone, with the fabricated positive emotions which would cause you to respond with positive fuel. That has gone. The darkness of devaluation has not yet commenced and its drawing of negative fuel. Instead, you are looking at the in-between. The eyes which are devoid of warmth or hatred, empty of passion or malice, are just a blank stare. You are seeing the void within us. This will cause you to become confused. It will have you ask whether everything is all right and have you wondering what has happened. You will be mystified as to where those mesmeric and scintillating gazes have gone. Why are you no longer looked at with that piercing and uplifting look? Where have we gone? If we had a soul to begin with, it is as if it has been sucked from within us, leaving only this husk behind. You cannot complain that you are being badly treated since no abuses have yet been deployed against you. This empty and robotic stare is a warning of what is to come, and should you see it in those you engage with, heed it and make good your departure, because it is signalling to you that a far worse stare awaits you. 3. The Stare in Devaluation Malice this, perhaps, is the stare that most associate with our kind. When you are subjected to our malicious stare, our eyes darken, emphasised by the contortion of our features, which makes us appear like something else. I emphasise appear, 
because we are not shape-shifting into a demon. We are not showing the demon that lurks within. It is a physical change in the composition of our face, accentuated by the furrowing of the bow, brow, the adjustment of the face, a physiological change that arises because of the malice that is rising from within. Our eyes darken, pupils widen, and that causes the eyes to go dark. It is not the demon appearing, but actual physical changes to us with regard to the way that we are looking, so that we end up looking like somebody else. A good way of equating how such changes can occur is to take you to two actors. First of all, Jim Carrey. Think about how, in effect, rubbery his face is. And he can contort it in such astonishing ways to look completely different, yet it is still Jim Carrey. Secondly, Billy Bob Thornton in the film Sling Blade. He not only altered his voice, but he jutted his jaw out, furrowed his brow, and it was a magnificent performance. And if you ever have a moment, uh, search on YouTube for In the Actor's Studio, where Billy Bob Thornton is being interviewed, and he is invited to become his character. And Thornton is just sat there talking normally. He's wearing a baseball cap. He lowers it, like a curtain coming across him, and when his face comes back up, he looks like somebody else as he shifts into this character. All that is being done is that he's rearranging his facial features, but he looks completely different. That is what is happening with us. Our narcissism causes our eyes to darken because of certain physical changes in terms of the pupil widening, becoming more dilated, because of a reduction of colour in the eye, the light is being drained, that our brow is furrowing, that our expression is twisted and darkened, so that we create this piercing, malevolent, frightening stare. There's no demon. We're not shape-shifting into some reptile or lizard. It is the narcissism contorting our features to create this piercing, malicious stare. Do understand that. When this happens, the glowing greens, the brilliant blues and blissful browns have all vanished. The glinting grey eyes are no more. The halcyon hazel has been banished, and instead a dark and glowing black has taken their place. This gaze will cause you to shrink back under its impact, intended by the narcissism. The hatred that is embodied in the inky darkness will turn you cold, send ice through your heart, and is enough for even some of you to be caused to burst into tears. Terror will grip you, because when this stare is deployed against you, you are seeing the malice in our core, the pure, unadulterated hatred that is manifested for you. You have threatened us in such a way to unleash this against you. It is seething, dense and vicious. It is a further form of manipulation generated by our narcissism to control you. It bears down on you, reminding you of your weaknesses and vulnerabilities, a blackened glare which keeps on driving at you, pressing down on you, forcing you to feel small and wretched. You may have caught the occasional malicious glance from us, just a flash of hatred, but that is something else. Those glimpses were warnings which could only be used for an instant to avoid detection by third parties and the fracturing of the facade. What I am talking about here is a stare. Sometimes it may be accompanied by hissed words of threat and insult. Sometimes it's cloaked in silence, the balefulness a clear warning that a period of heavy silence will be now visited upon you. The person that you thought we were will be utterly absent, the illusion disappearing. Your world has been annihilated in an instant and replaced by the manufacture of two orbs of glinting black which tell you that you are hated because you are threatening our control in some way. And this is the response. You are totally hated and that much worse will be visited on you in conjunction with this stare of concentrated evil 
unless you provide us with the control and fuel that we demand. Number four, the stare in the disengagement. This is perhaps witnessed if you are actually told of your disengagement. More often, it appears post-disengagement when you try to see us, to plead with us for answers, to beg us to take you back and so forth. This stare is one of pure contempt, disdain and distaste for you. How on earth did we come to couple with one so weak, so pathetic and so disgusting as you? You make us shudder to think that we once even looked at you with favour, love and longing. That is, if our narcissism even remembers us to allow that. The annoyance we feel at choosing someone like you is thrust to one side to be overridden by a contemptuous stare that is designed to weaken you in your tracks and to tell you that in no uncertain terms we want nothing to do with you. We have someone far better. This stare is to urge you to keep away, it's asserting control over you, and to forbid you from remind us what, that we once promised you the world. We do not want you threatening our control by bringing such matters up. Somebody else receives those promises now. You are an unfortunate reminder of a part of us that we prefer to keep locked away, indeed erased, and this stare conveys that through contempt and loathing. Number five, the stare in the hoover. A malign follow-up hoover, as you would expect, applies the same approach as the malicious stare that I've explained earlier. Should we make contact with you for the purposes of trying to convince you to return to us, whether it is post-disengagement or post-escape, we will look to hold your gaze once again. This time, the eyes of ours will shine again, but with hope, longing and contrition. Vulnerability, sorrow and remorse, all faked, of course, may appear to loom large in the rounded and pleading gauge which we now hold you in. Thus, the stare in the hoover could be malign, it could be benign in terms of uh, with apparent hope and longing and contrition. It might be with false joy, false happiness, an apparent vulnerability or sorrow. Malign or benign in order to draw you back in. All of this is pure artifice. All we do is mirror back to you what you might be showing to us. You show us the hope that we might have seen the error of our ways, the longing for us to come to the realisation that we have done wrong, the sorrow for a person who must behave in the manner that we do, the remorse that you engage with someone so vile as us, the longing that you have for the golden period to shine once again. It is all fabricated and manufactured, delivered by our narcissism, either unconsciously where lesser or mid-range, or consciously where greater or ultra, as we mirror back to you what we see, but for the purposes of conning you and hoodwinking you once again, and with mealy-mouthed assurances and never-to-be-delivered promises, we hook you back into our grasp. The stare is a prominent weapon when we engage and ensnare you. It is a device that fabricates certain emotions and allows us to see the reality of who you have entangled with when you look upon the emptiness and shrink from the malice. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.